this month's DVD, we continue our series of road train classics. This time, we look at a program I filmed in 1997. There are a few sad memories in this program, a story I did with Eddie Holland. Sadly, Eddie passed away earlier this year. And memories of Noel Buntine at the naming of the Buntine Highway. Noel's son, Dennis, also passed away this year. And the story on the UTO transport operation, of course, long gone from our highways. Anyhow, that's enough from me. Time to watch Road Train 2. G'day, my name is Bruce Honeywell and welcome to the second program on the road trains of Australia. We're going to see some of the biggest trucks in the world operating the most gruelling conditions and we'll meet the people who operate them. We'll have a look at the world's biggest on-highway truck, a six-trailer ore carrier hauling to a specially constructed port in the remote gulf of Carpentaria. We're capable of shifting 12, 1300 tonne a day. We'll travel to northwest Queensland and take a ride in a Max Superliner Titan powered by the new 610 horsepower engine. Yeah, getting a bit of good times and better fuel economy. Uh, so, you know, it all adds up to more money in the pocket. We'll go a little into history and look at the life of a man who's been raised to fatherhood status of the modern road train operation, Noel Buntine. Sadly, Noel passed away recently, but his name has been enshrined in the naming of the Buntine Highway. And finally, finally, the trucking industry in Australia has produced many characters, but one of the best known and most outspoken is Eddie Holland. I just can't afford to uh, operate how I operate because I've got everything paid for and I can sit back for a week or two or three. <laughs> and they do it big in the West. Mitchell Fuel runs one of Australia's largest fuel haulage operations and is continually seeking more efficient ways to work. The latest venture is into a four-trailer outfit pulled by a triaxle drive Kenworth. Sitting on roughly 85 kilometres, which is fairly good for the, for the weight that we are, you know, up to close to 170 tonne. So come with us into Outback Australia, and in this program, we'll look at these operations and more. We're here in the tropical Gulf country of the Northern Territory, but we're here only to see one thing. That's the world's biggest road registered truck, grossing 200 tonnes, running on 108 wheels. Borroloola has been around a long time. It grew to a large town last century when it became an entry point for hopeful setting off to various gold finds across the Territory and the Kimberley. The jewel of Borroloola is the MacArthur River a beautiful expanse of blue that attracts thousands of barramundi anglers from around the world. Today, the town survives on local commerce, tourism and a large mine opened in recent years just down the track. The mine is 120 kilometres from the nearest point where ore can be loaded onto ships. And to get the ore to the port, they use the biggest road train in the world. Yeah, well, we've been, the mine's been running for probably 18 months, a bit more producing concentrate, and we've been shifting it at the rate of probably 800 tonne a day for the first eight to 10 months, and uh, bumped the production up now, we're shifting up around 1,000 tonne a day. Roy Girl is the operations manager for United Transport Operations. He is responsible for keeping the transport chain flowing, getting the ore from the mine stockpile onto ships. It's a zinc lead, 7% lead content in the zinc. It's ground to approximately 6 microns, which is pretty fine, so we have to have all the trailers tarped to keep the product from blowing out, environmental reasons. The driver loads his own truck, all six trailers, does his bookwork and leaves the mine. Fully loaded, the truck grosses 205 tonnes, with 22 tonnes to each axle group. After weighing and leaving the mine, it's a hard pull for the first stretch. You don't usually hit top till 
you're about 20 k's out from the mine, that's usually the hillier, hillier part, and once you get over that, you'll sit at the top here. Then. So what's this biggest of the big like to drive? Better tracking than a normal triple, yeah, it's just designed really well for it, yeah. Yeah, it's got an 18 speed, uh, 550 horsepower cap, and she goes really well, really does the job. Through the hills, you're usually sitting on about 60, but once you get up and going, you speed limit up to 85, and that's the top speed you can get on there. We're capable of shifting 12, 1300 tonne a day. It's 120 kilometres per one way. Um, the drivers do two and a half shifts, two and a half trips every shift. Um, takes them approximately four hours to do a round trip per driver. Well you've got 12 hour shifts and um, each shift you change over usually here for later and down the turn off at the empty and, and it's just unloading of the cons down at Bing Bong in the shed then when you've unloaded you head back to the mine and reload yourself again there using a 9 semi loader and just back again for another trip. We've got two trucks that work out of the mine. They uh, work 24 hours a day, four drivers, um, two 12 hour shifts each. Trucks, they've got Caterpillar engine, 550 horsepower, um, Rockwell diffs, Eaton gearbox. Uh, they travel at approximately 85 kilometres an hour. And, uh, they keep that pace pretty well. How have the electronically managed cats been handling the big job? Yeah, we got a bit more out of the first engine than we thought we would. We banked on uh, 380 to 400,000 and we got uh, 450,000 out of the first engine, so they're doing a pretty good job. Getting the trucks tuned to the job has been a learning curve for all involved. Using low profile tyres on the triaxle drive had the effect of lowering the gearing to the road and substantially improved trip times. We're getting approximately 60,000 kilometres out of a set of drives and around 100,000 out of the trailer tyres, which is pretty fair for what we're doing with it all. Day and night, the trucks travel the 120 kilometres or 240 kilometre round trip, hauling ore to the stockpiles in UTO shed at Bing Bong Wharf. It's a big shed, it's comprised of four bays and you just drive up through the centre, you can have a tip, well, tip on the driver's side, so you either go through the front or the back to tip on either side and usually tip three in each in each bay and try and get them level like that, yeah. And we got two 970 loaders that work out of the shed. We feed the conveyor system, comes through as you can see behind us here, just comes up into the back of the barge here and we load 3,000 tonne of time. The ship takes it out to sea and uh, that's UTO's involvement in the concentrate from MacArthur River to here. We get approximately three ships a month come into here, all depends the size of them. A fair bit of it goes to England, some to Germany, uh, China, Russia, just about anywhere where there's big smelters. And how long will the MacArthur River supply the world with zinc? Yeah, I think there's approximately um, 50 years plus left in it. I don't think I'll see it shut. <laughs> what do you do in your spare time at a remote place like Borolula? Yeah, I get to go fishing on occasions, not, not often enough, but yeah. On occasion. But to truckies, the showpiece of the MacArthur River operation is the record breaking road trains. Oh, this one they tell me now, it's in the um, record books. It's the biggest, heaviest road registered truck in the world, as far as I know. We get two of them here. It's a long way from the banks of the beautiful MacArthur River to here. We're in the town of Huendon, a small town in the northwest of Queensland. We're going to meet Clary Hayden, the bloke who owns the first 610 horsepower Mac Titan road train. This truck is powered by Mack Truck's most powerful engine yet. In fact, it's claimed to be the most powerful production truck engine in the world. The engine powers a prime mover in the small two-truck fleet of Wyoming Transport. Clary Hayden and his partner Jan run the Outback Queensland operation from Wyoming Station, specialising in livestock transport. Like the pastoral industry itself, livestock transport is dependent upon the vagaries of climatic change. 
Drought means that large numbers of cattle are either sold or sent away on adjustment, where the owners pay to have their stock paddocked. After drought breaking rains, the transporters are again busy, bringing cattle back to their home stations and bringing cattle from sale yards to fatten on the bonanza of grass the rain has brought. The 1996-97 wet season in Northern Australia was a record breaker. Even towns like Mount Isa, normally in a cauldron of red rocky hills, seemed to swim in a sea of green grass. The wet seasons bring challenges for road train operators, but the rivers finally lower enough to allow the big trucks to continue. Water levels drop and life on the highways and byways comes back to normal. And for the livestock operator, this generally means a busy time. We caught up with Clary Hayden at the top of the hill roadhouse, just out of Hewenden in the central north of Queensland. It was the start of a long day and would give us a chance to see how Max Letter's Superliner Titan was handling the outback. We're to pick up six decks of cattle at the Hewenden sale We've got six decks on and uh, we're going to head out along the dirt about 120 k to a place and unload and uh, come back. It's a sort of fairly different sort of roads. There's a bit of bitumen, uh, some dirt, some good dirt, some fairly rough dirt, a few little gullies, that sort of stuff to climb through. And, uh, That'll battle to see the day out. The cattle we're to load have to be dipped and cleared by stock inspectors and then taken to a station southwest of Hewenden. People are buying back in and um, stocking up, hoping that they'll get a couple of good years now, you know, before it goes off again. If the prices stop up a few, we'll make a bit of money. He bought them to probably uh, breed out of the cows and uh, fatten the steers and send them off to Darwin Export, probably. At Hewenden's sale yards, the action has started. The cattle that are to be loaded on Clary's triple road train, about 200 in all, are being dipped. This is a plunge dip that gets rid of the cattle tick. Hewenden is on the tick line, and where these cattle are going is tick free. So it's of utmost importance that no ticks go with the cattle. After inspection, the cattle are ready to load. Clary sets up the crossovers on his trailers. These allow cattle to pass through the trailers while loading. The entire road train can be loaded without it having to move. Hewenden yards have both top and bottom deck loading ramps. This allows cattle to be loaded quietly and reduces the chances of bruising. The top decks are loaded first. Clary secures each compartment and locks into place the crossovers. The bottom decks are loaded and in a surprisingly short time, the six decks of the three trailers are secured. And it's time to make a mile. Clary Hayden, born and raised in Hewenden, has been truck driving all his life. Uh, my father was in trucks before I was, and I just uh, liked them, so I just kept on going. When I got my license, I just started to drive. I drove trucks right from when I was old enough to drive them, and. Uh, uh, we just kicked this business off six years ago, just uh, bought a truck and, uh, of our own and started to cart cattle there. Starting off with older trucks, Clary and Jan have done well. We asked Clary if running a livestock operation from a cattle station was a handicap. It, uh, if it was a big outfit, it had to be in town, you know, but uh, because of the um, employees, but for the hours it doesn't matter. The booking, you know, and it doesn't matter where they come from, really. Uh, you know, it doesn't matter whether it's out of town or in town, no. The truck winds out of Hewenden and out along the narrow, rough bitumen. We meet the second truck of the Wyoming fleet heading into town to pick up another load. A brief chat and it's back to the wheel. The bitumen changes to dirt. Great winding sweeps of unsealed road. And the country opens up to form the horizon stretching open plains of Western Queensland's Downs country. As we head out further, the road deteriorates. But the Big Mac pulls six decks with total aloofness to the weight and the conditions. It's a lot better to drive, it's more comfortable. It's, uh, it's, uh, once you put it in top gear on the open road, well, it just stops there. It's, it's very easy to drive like that. Very good to drive, easy to handle, easy to keep on the road. Uh, you don't have to fight it anyway in any sort of road. It'll just sort of go straight down it, but it maintains its uh, 
pace in top gear. That's the, that's the biggest thing I find. You know, it's, uh, you're not going on it. You can still do 90 kilometres an hour, but you uh, uh, your average speeds up a lot on what it was with the other truck. The Wyoming business handles a mixture of operating conditions. Medium haul to cattle stations like today and long haul runs with export cattle. Pull six decks most of the time, uh, Darwin, Crumble, Townsville and uh, down south to Roma and Dolby, those places. And uh, yeah, it's volume loading so we can, we can pull uh, sort of six decks of cattle. The weight doesn't sort of worry, it's up to about 115 tonne most of the time. Uh, all over, pretty well all over Queensland and uh, the Northern Territory. So what about the 610 engine? Max latest. It's a 16 litre V8 with VMAC electronic engine management. Quite good, yeah, I like it a lot. It's uh, got plenty of power and, and torque up uh, in top gear, it rolls along the road really well. This truck here, um, it, it'll uh, scramble over a hill in top gear where uh, the old Superliner got to drop a full gear. This Superliner Titan was first fitted with the 575 engine before Mac picked the Wyoming operation to try out the new 610. Is there much difference between the 575 and 610 engines? It, uh, the biggest difference is maintaining the pace in top gear. It, it maintains its uh, uh, 90 kilometres an hour a lot better than the 575 did. Hills that I'd, I'd uh, sort of split a gear or drop a gear in with the 575, this goes over the top quite easy. Uh, with the six decks and As we head out, the speed drops and the road narrows. This is country where city owners of four-wheel drives would think twice about taking their off-road vehicle. But Clary pilots his triple road train along the track with total confidence. Has the electronically managed engine been a problem in remote areas? It's all right when you get used to it. I found it a bit hard to get used to it, but it's, uh, the more I drive it, the more I like it. And after the best part of a day in the saddle, Clary reaches Tirumburby Station, our destination. The cattle come off the truck easily and within an hour we'll be feeding on the sweet grass of the best season in a decade. Having the most powerful truck in the country might be okay, but what is it doing for Wyoming's bottom line? Getting better trip times and better fuel economy, uh, so you know it all adds up to more money in the pocket. Doing 1.1 uh, um, uh, kilometres to the litre uh, with six decks round trip. Every 10 kilometres I'm picking one up, picking a litre of fuel up, so it's uh, you know, a fair bit over 12 months. So to Clary and Jan Hayden, so far it's been a happy choice to go with Max Big Power Titan. And since we filmed this report from Hewenden, Clary has traded his old Superliner in on his second 610 Titan. That surely must reflect a man happy with his Mac. Noel Bunton is a name that will need no introduction to Outback Australians. After a lifetime in the business of livestock haulage, he passed away recently. But he'll be remembered by the naming of a highway that carried his trucks for the better part of half a century. I was there for the opening of the Bunton Highway. It was a gathering of people from right across the Territory, all meeting at this remote place, 120 kilometres from Catherine, for one reason, to pay homage to Noel Buntine. He was just a remarkable man to work for, you know. You'd... Noel Buntine was a man who presided over one of history's major turns. He and his transport operation, Buntine Roadways, pioneered cattle transport in the Northern Territory and the Kimberleys. Sadly to some, this saw the demise of the horseback drover. But in the place of the drover, Buntine Roadways built a new outback mythology. Noel Buntine was known as a hard but fair boss. Every man's got a different personality and Noel studied every man and every personality. And he worked every man to whatever his personality was. But he's, he's one of the whitest men I ever worked for. Harry Carrer and Jack Taylor together worked a total of 65 years for Noel Buntine. Now, if you work for a bloke now and, and you work four days and haven't got to work for three days, they want to sit you down and don't pay you. Buntine paid you from the, the day of you. And I think when I first started Noel, I got £27 a week. It was 
big money them days too. Mrs Patty Buntine raised a family in the then frontier town of Catherine. I don't think people can envisage what it used to be like. I know we drive along in our air-conditioned cars, you know, and um, before in the, in, the, in the trucks, like the men had to do it anyway, there was no air-conditioning. It was rough, it was dusty, it was hot, it was awful. Uh, but they were achieving something and I think possibly as they were doing it, they may not have felt it, but um, you know, after they'd done it, they realised that, that they are part of history and, and, uh, and a really important part of history too now because everything's reasonably easy, isn't it? Noel Buntine was a leader. He produced loyalty and respect from his drivers. This was evident with the full crew who arrived at the opening of the Buntine Highway. The Buntine Highway runs from Willaroo some 120 kilometres west of Catherine, down through Top Springs into Western Australia to Nicholson Station. This was the road, all rough bulldust, corrugations and jump-ups, where Buntine and his men made a name for themselves. This was the road to Victoria River Downs, VRD, one of the biggest cattle stations in the world. The most used road, it's a lot bigger for a carton from BRD. And that's where it started off in the big carton. I remember years ago, Noel said to me, on, on any day, Harry, we'd have ten road trains on BRD. And they all come this way. The road brought back many memories for the Buntine drivers from those early days, like when Harry Carra had 18 flat tyres in one rough stretch of what now is the Buntine Highway. I mended 14 between Camfield and Top Springs and dragged four flats in. I didn't have the heart to do the other four. And you come in and you mend your own tyres, half a dozen tyres, fuel your truck up, and face it out, the gate out, and then you go home. Nobody was ever guilty of thing, and if you was home, you might be home 20 minutes, and you'd ring up and say, hey, send somebody to get you. <laughs> So they gathered by this great hunk of Northern Territory granite to talk and remember the days working for Buntine. And it was time for formalities. This monument isn't only to Noel, but to all the drivers and support people who worked for him for the years. Without them for a backbone, he may not have succeeded. Noel Buntine was a practical man with enormous knowledge and experience. All the more valuable because he was willing to share it with people from all walks of life, and there are people from all walks of life here today. And finally, finally, Noel, but on to his friends, has been put to rest. Thank you. The monument dedicated, the photos taken, and it was time to have a beer and spin a yarn in memory of the Buntine years. And keep the old stories going, like how Admiral Jack got his name when he had to take evasive action when driving his road train out around a truck parked at the Ferguson River. And too late, seeing it was in flood. Paddle it straight in the drink. You had to get out of a beam model through the windows so you can full of water. <laughs> Forty foot under and I got on top of the cabin, I was still under water. And I climbed along the crate and the last boat was just hanging out the water. Night time it was and the lights were still going under the water. He was an admiral because he wouldn't leave the ship. And late in the afternoon, a road trains of Australia road train rumbles on to the newly named Buntine Highway. The RTA fleet is the modern successor to Buntine Roadways, still working this road after all these years. A road that will carry the name of a transport pioneer for all time. Road trains are the most common form of efficient transport in outback Australia, but occasionally we see some huge lifts on floats, like this 450 tonne monster that needed three prime movers to complete the task. What's 1,500 horsepower grosses 450 tonne? and runs on more than 200 wheels? Well, it's not a conventional road train. 
It's a heavy lift on floats. A giant transformer heading across the country from the manufacturers in Brisbane, Queensland, nearly 5,000 kilometres to Port Augusta in South Australia. All up were 100 metres long, uh, 5 metres wide, just over 5 high, a uh, gross weight of 450 tonnes. Um, we've got, uh, at the moment, we've only got two pullers and one pusher vehicle on it. We caught up with this big rig under major escort conditions just south of Alice Springs in Central Australia. The outfit took two weeks to get from Brisbane to Alice Springs and still had another week on the road before unloading. Archie Draper, Queensland manager for Megalift, is the road boss for the lift. Yeah, it's two 12 axle Cometo trailers with beams and there's 12 axles each trailer with eight tyres, eight wheels on each axle. Drivers work 12 to 14 hours a day to get the load through. Power comes from three Max Superliners, each rated at 500 horsepower. The huge transformer is supported on beams between the two trailers. A big load. You can just about feel the earth move. Road train operators are usually rugged individualists but occasionally a character steps out from even this colourful crowd. One such bloke is Eddie Holland, an operator who's always done it his own way. Eddie Holland is a bloke who always has done it his way, right down to building his own truck. Now a very well-known beast called the Eddie Liner. This hybrid Mac has caught more than the eye of its proud owner. In 1996, it was picked by Australia's leading transport magazine as the rig of the year. That is and it's basically the awards for owner-operators and small fleet owners. Uh, the award is recognition of the type of work they're doing. Uh, the, the truck is uh, basically their, their uh, tool of trade, but also their home away from home. Uh, it's uh, their life. Uh, they live the things, and uh, we just sort of like to, with the competition, say, uh, recognise not just the winners but uh, the, everyone else that's out there doing it tough. The Eddy Liner is a cross between Max old V8 value liner and a super liner powered by a Caterpillar engine. It was a proud day for the Holland family as they led the rig of the year convoy through the streets of Darwin. The convoy was an all-time record for the competition with 160 trucks turning out, stressing the extremely important role transport plays in the Northern Territory. And Eddie Holland was proud. Oh, it's the highest achievement you can win in the transport industry, I think. Like we can drink rum till dawn and fight till our luck as a bear, but we got $5,000, we're donating it to the children. So we all got hearts. But just who is Eddie Holland? He is outspoken, described by himself as a bit of a larrikin. He built his business in the days when laws and regulations were a little less stringently enforced. The days when you wouldn't take your truck for a drive unless it was well and truly loaded to the limit and way beyond. We caught up with Eddie and his partner and wife Julie in Darwin. Uh, Dad used to be uh, in the trucks in the early, late 50s, early 60s. And I uh, was neat out of grass up and used to go with him. The old ERF, 37 mile an hour flat out. <laughs> then when I turned 16, got me licence. Away I went, went. This Max Superliner, the predecessor to the Eddy Liner, has worked well in the Holland operation. And I've had that truck for 12 years now, got yeah, nearly 12 years now. And uh, she's earned every cent I got. And uh, three motors. Uh, I've had one re-race in, in, in 11 years, so the motor's done, well the truck's done nearly two, kilometer, uh, two million kilometres. Might well, not be much, but it's all two, three trailer work and seen every dirt road in Australia. Yeah, I've got the missus with me, and 
I'm the brains behind the show, so she's the brawn. <laughs> I'll make sure we keep it that way. <laughs> we just uh, met at the pub that I was working at the, at the Moringa, oh, yeah. and uh, he said, if you ever come down to Adelaide, come and see. Actually, what he said to me was, um, my truck's the nicest truck that you'll see up here. <laughs> and I met Julie there, and uh, she told me her dad used to be in transport, and I, I told her I had a sexy looking truck, and she didn't like the colour of it until she saw it. <laughs> Anyway, once she saw the truck, she saw the colour scheme, it was a silver and orange. And uh, had the big bung in it, 55-inch bung in it, which I still got. And then just, you know, went on from there. So, yeah. And 10 years down the track, we're still going. And uh, then Julie started coming with me up and down the road, and I tell you what, I've had mates and uh, guys, uh, two up blokes, partners, but uh, Julie beats a lot. Julie Holland dreamed of driving trucks from a very young age, but she probably never imagined she would make a living driving 100 ton plus road trains. I was about 13 when I said to my dad um, that by the time I'm 21, because that's New South Wales, that by the time I'm 21 I'll be driving trucks. And I met Eddie just before I turned 19 and went from there. I think in the beginning it was, uh, you know, ha, I'll show you I can do it. But now it's like a real job. <laughs> it's the same as any job, I think. You, know, you sort of you know that you've got to do it to you know to get your pay. So the Hayes Creek jump up is the steepest jump up on the Stewart Highway, a challenge for experienced road train drivers. But Julie, in the rig grossing more than 100 tons, attacks it with confidence. with a typical reaction when an air splitter hose lets go. How does Julie handle the heavier jobs associated with truck driving, like changing a tyre? You just do it yourself. You know, like it may take me a little bit longer to change a tyre and, and what it's heavy, but you still do it. You just do it, you know, that sort of... Uh, I think most of the girls that are out there driving, it's, that's their motto too, you know, if you can do it then just go ahead and, and, and do it type thing, you know, no point in fussing about saying, you know, I'm going to break one of my nails or, you know, is my hair out of place or whatever, so. The arrival of daughter Kimberly has increased Julie's workload even more. So how did Eddie Holland make the shift from driving trucks to running a business and owning trucks? I sort of went with a bloke sort of partnership and uh, he was an old bloke and I was a young bloke and all I wanted to do was drive road trains and I got a Mac and I ended up pranging that. We had no bull bar on it and I hit a bullock the other side of Gaston down the Timber Creek Road and I got dragged underneath the truck. I was there for seven hours and uh, left me in hospital for seven months. And Yeah, then uh, when I got out of hospital I had a few dollars together and uh, I put that down on a, uh, on a brand new 320 cool power Mac back in 75 I think it was and uh, I called it the Happy Hooker. And I was doing Adelaide Alice Springs Darwin. That was when it was all dirt. From those early beginnings, the business grew, and since Eddie and Julie have lived and worked together, the business has grown even more strongly. An 80, 20%. He does 20%, and I do the other 80%. <laughs> uh, it's, yeah, it, uh, when I first met Eddie, he had the uh, one truck full time and then another little one that just sort of an old Benz I think it was um, running around town and doing single trailers and what else have you and it's sort of, sort of grown into three trailers used to get the accountant to do all the book work and now I do most of the ledgers look after the invoices and pay the bills and ring up all the people who don't pay you on time get abused by the bank <laughs> look after the baby clean the house wash the truck <laughs> anything else I do love Things have changed in the transport industry. Bitumen roads to the Territory have meant a loss of the old way of life on the road. Eddie has seen increasing pressures placed on subbies. I'm an owner driver and uh, we, uh, we serve as warehouses at the moment uh, for Visiboard. And there's, uh, we've got a time to do it, but uh, we're not pushed like every other body else. Like uh, the blokes from Alice Darwin, and I, I do Adelaide Darwin, Melbourne Darwin. And from Alice to Darwin, they do four trips to my one. <laughs> I put on more weight than them, though. <laughs> no, we, I, I just, uh, I just take it easy now. 
I've got all my gear paid for, I've got a couple of trucks. And Running your own business, we run the three trucks now, running three trucks and a baby and trying to get all the paperwork and keep a house and you know keep a baby as well is uh, really a full-time job I'm that far behind on. The truck's a quarter million dollars now and uh, the rates haven't changed all that deal. Everything's going up higher and higher, expenses are going up higher and higher. Ooh, changing gears love, eh? Yeah, and uh, I just can't afford to uh, operate how I operate because I've got everything paid for and I can sit back for a week or two or three. <laughs> Even with the responsibility of Kimberley and the administration of business and house, Julie still finds time to get behind the wheel. I uh, run the trails up Port Augusta and Wallace Heavy, which is sort of two and three times a week, so it's sort of night time while she's asleep, so yeah, yeah, it's still fun. So now, with the Eddie Liner winning the Rig of the Year competition, at least one of Eddie's long-time dreams has been fulfilled. For the Hollands, as with all small business people, the future will have both good and troubled times. But you can't help thinking whatever is served up to this couple, they'll meet it with a grin. There's a saying, behind every successful businessman, there's an exhausted woman. Yeah. Well, that's right. <laughs> that's right, love. <laughs> oh, another wee. Uh oh. Another wee. Western Australia is a bit like Texas. Everything's done in a big way. And that's what this story is all about a fuel haulage operation lifting 150,000 litres in one lift on 86 wheels, supplying remote gold mines. The supply of energy to remote mine sites, pastoral properties, and communities brings with it a load of logistical problems in the remote areas of Australia. Mine sites, the most energy hungry industry, are too remote, distance is too long, and ore body life expectancy is too short to see high capital infrastructures such as power lines, pipelines or railways being developed. So remote mines live on diesel fuel, and to maintain supply there is total dependence on one industry road transport. In the Northern Territory, conventional triple road trains are used to deliver fuel to the wide range of mines found in the deserts and tropical savannas. These great trucks run supremely efficiently, carrying around 90,000 litres of fuel with gross tonnages up to 115 tonnes. But even this efficient form of road transport has been left in the shade in Western Australia, where in a marriage of convenience between operators and the state government legislators, legal loads of upwards of 145,000 litres are being carried with gross weights of more than 170 tonnes. One company operating at the forefront of this technology is Mitchell Fuel. Mitchell Fuel is headquartered in the quiet coastal town of Geraldton, about 400 kilometres north of the state's capital, Perth. Mark Cale helps organise the complex web of fuel deliveries. We run from right down to Perth up to Port Ellen. We're just about to take over Port Ellen Depot up there now. We run right out to up to Mount Magnet, out to um, Maluna, Eagle Mining out there, up up to Newman, up to Plutonic, all up there, yeah, right up to all up Port Ellen, down to Exmouth, uh, Carnarvon. The transport web of Mitchell Fuels stretches over most of remote Western Australia. The company supplies fuel and lubricants to towns, communities, wheat farms, sheep and cattle stations throughout the state. This four trailer unit, pulled by a tri-drive Kenworth T950 prime mover, is loading diesel for a trip to gold mines in the remote Western Australian desert. Its configuration, along with a concessional loading permit from the Western Australian government, allows the high load capacity that makes efficient delivery of energy to remote centres possible. The truck spreads the enormous weight evenly to the road surface through a series of triple axle groupings throughout the truck. Kenworth's a uh, single steer, but they have got tri-drive 
which means uh, we can actually pull a lot more weight with the tri drive than a bogey drive uh, truck. We've got all tri dollies and tri axles all through the whole outfit. In effect, the outfit consists of a conventional 40,000 litre barrel as lead trailer, a B double on a triple axle dolly hooked on behind the lead, and the conventional 40,000 litre trailer bringing up the rear, also on a tri axle dolly. It's a, a triple with uh, an A trailer put in the middle, added on to it. So, yeah, quite yeah. a long outfit. Yeah. Good for steering and going around corners, and actual turning circles are good. It's a bigger outfit than the double B doubles being used elsewhere. Overall length, it's probably about the same 53 and a half metres, but they actually carry a lot more fuel. The road train is loaded. It's time to head out and we're going on a 1400 kilometer round trip to the gold mines at the remote center of Waluna. Driver Garth Riley heads the great beast out and going as slow in the pulls as we leave the low coastal centre of Geraldton. We're, um, we're going to Waluna from Geraldton up through Mikasara and uh, head to the Gumbrell Highway out there to uh, a place called Waluna Gold Mines and we're doing deliveries around there in the area. Wheat trucks scurry back and forth, hauling the state's golden harvest to ships at Geraldton. The Kenworth is comfortable and quiet inside the cab as the powerful Cummins N14 meets the needs of the massive load. We're um, sitting on roughly 85 kilometres, which is fairly good for the, for the weight that we are, you know, up to close to 170 tonne. And um, it seems to be doing it easy. It's, it's not lugging or anything. I'm just running along at 1,700 revs, so it's doing it quite easy. It's good. We come to the small wheat town of Mullawa. Garth has to drop off a drum of lubricant to the Mitchell fuel depot. The wheat trucks rumble into the Mullawa silos to load. A Mac power double B double purrs past, an impressive outfit, but it can't handle the load the Mitchell truck does. Back on the road, the Kenworth heads out beyond the farming country now. What's the tri drive like to drive? I think with the tri drive, it, it's a uh, yeah gives it a more smoother ride, but it's all airbag suspension, um, parabolic springs on the front, but uh, and very smooth. But there is one habit the driver needs to watch with tri-drive and super single tyres on the steer. When you come up to a corner and you, you, you leap, as you come around a corner you can't put the boot into it because the front axle is, uh, the power divider is locked in, It'll uh, even if you turn the steering wheel it'll still steer you straight across, straight ahead. You just got to back off a little bit as you're, as you're going around the corner, that's all. But um, apart from that, it's, it's much the same. Just got to be a bit more on your guard when you're, especially in the, in the wet or in the mud or anything like that, you, you can't just power around corners because you'll end up buddy going straight ahead. And what's the four trailer road train like to handle? Trailers are all airbag suspension, all with lift axles, um, four tries, chill tyres, tracks very well, even better than a, uh, a normal triple road train. It um, seems to follow itself better. Why is that? I think it's more turning points, um, pivot points, articulations, it seems to follow itself better. You drop off the bitumen and you, you come back on a bit too hard, she, doesn't, she seems to follow you back on, she doesn't, she doesn't whip around like a third trailer, she'll, third trailer on a triple, she'll, she'll whip herself around a bit, but uh, this, this setup seems to be really, very smooth. Just near the township of Mount Magnet, the Geraldton Road meets the Great Northern Highway. Here, the Mitchell Fuel Road Train turns northward. It's afternoon, readies to turn tonight. Mount Magnet is a mining town and has ridden the booms and depressions of mining fortunes deep in Australia's outback. With the sun set, 
Garth Riley concentrates on getting to his destination before the sun rises once more. We're going to mining operations um, and drillers, uh, mainly um, diesel is used for, uh, for the mining operations. I went to Walloona for gold mining uh, and the drillers. There's two drilling, drilling mobs I've got to deliver to. A, um, we've got two small deliveries there for the drilling rigs and the machines. But uh, the majority of it's going to um, for, the, for the earth moving machines around the area. And after a night on the road and a regulatory sleep time, we find ourselves at Waluna Gold. Still before daylight, the miners come up from the underground and hose down their vehicle ready for the next shift. And on first light, Garth is checking his tankers and unloads, pumping diesel into the storage tanks. This procedure is carried out again and again as the morning becomes noon. The mining roads are not always designed for road trains the length of this one, but the skill of the driver sees the trucks snaking through seemingly impossible corners. Mining companies, drilling companies, and even a company that uses the diesel to make the explosive for the mines. Compartment by compartment, tank by tank, the fuel comes off. A quick check of the N14 after the gruelling pull up from the coast. So why did Mitchell Fuel go with Cummins? We decided to go with Cummins. They're a good motor, we haven't had any problems with them at all. We've got an international, we've got a Western style, and we just wanted to keep them all the same motor. The N14 is an electronically managed engine. Just how are the electronics standing up to life in the outback? Good, we haven't had any problems with electronics so far. We haven't had anyone stuck out in the bush with electronic problems. With all tankers empty, it's time to head back towards Geraldton. How does Mitchell Fuel run driver shifts to maintain utilisation of the high capital investment in these trucks? It's about a 1400k uh, round trip. Offload in four different places and then lift all the axles up and come home as quick as we can. Next bloke jumps in and he does the same thing. They keep the trucks working pretty well, non-stop, seven days a week. As soon as the driver gets in, another driver, a fresh driver, he'll hop in and he'll go up the road. We drive into the second night. Around midnight, we get back to the depot. Garth refuels and washes the prime mover before heading off to his family and home. Just the prime movers are washed. Every trip kept clean. Uh, a new driver will jump in and he'll, he'll take the truck up the road and they just keep it working on it so that the trucks never really cool down. They're, they're pretty well going all the time. Going all the time to keep the energy up to the ever-hungry export industries of Western Australia. Well, that's about it for this time round. Thanks for taking the time to share some of the most interesting road train operations in Outback Australia. I look forward to meeting you again somewhere up the track. <laughs>